Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. So today we are really fortunate to have Dr. Stan uh, Stancy Finley to speak to us. So Dr. Finley is the Gordon S. Marshall Early Career Chair and Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Southern California. So Dr. Philly received her bachelor degree in chemical engineering from Florida A&M University and obtained her PhD in chemical engineering from North, uh, Northwestern University. And then she did her uh, postdoc training at John Hopkins in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So Dr. Philly joined the faculty at USC uh, in 2013 and she led the computational system biology laboratory there. So Dr. Finley has drawn appointments in the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering and Material Science and the Quantitative and Computational Biology. And she's also a member of the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Finley is also the founding, uh, the founding uh, director of the Cancer for Computational Modeling of Cancer at the USC. And all across her career, she received many, many awards. It will take five to minutes, uh, five to ten minutes to introduce all the awards she received. So I will skip that. So, uh, Dr. Finley, we are really excited about uh, your seminar today, titled Mechanis "Mechanistic Modeling of Immune Cell Activation in Cancer." Um, so, welcome, and please take away. Oh, we can now hear you. Of course, yes, that would only be appropriate. Okay, so thank you for the invitation and the introduction. I'm excited to tell you about my research um, and to have this chance to share our work with, uh, with the department in computational medicine and bioinformatics. Um, so I've been focusing on over the last four or five years of uh, being able to develop mechanistic models of immune cell activation in the context of cancer. And this is really uh, situated in a larger field uh, called mathematical oncology, where we're using mathematical models and computational tools to probe the complexities of cancer. Uh, we can all uh, agree that cancer is quite complex. It involves a number of different cell types. Of course, the disease cells are there, immune cells and other stromal elements. It involves different processes. And here I'm just highlighting angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels. And it involves these cells interactions and processes that happen over different length scales and time scales. And so having a quantitative understanding of the tumor microenvironment uh, can be quite useful in understanding the response to treatment and just gaining a more um, deeper uh, view of uh, tumor growth. So the goal of my research lab is to be able to predict the dynamics of biochemical reaction networks. This stems from my training as a chemical engineer. Uh, and we want to do this, understand the dynamics in order to help develop new drug treatments, but also just to uh, understand the effects of existing uh, treatment strategies. And to do this, we're applying systems biology tools, so studying the whole system rather than individual parts by combining mathematical modeling and experimental studies, although we really rely quite heavily on uh, some fantastic collaborators for experimental data and experimental validation of our models. So I'll get started by, you know, just motivating even further the need to explore immune cells and other cells within the tumor microenvironment because there are lots of different interactions between cell uh, populations. So certainly between tumor and immune cells, for example, how T cells can mediate tumor cell killing, how tumor cells can lead to exhaustion of T cells interactions between tumor cells and stromal cells. Uh, so for example, tumor cells secreting a protein called VEGF that can promote the formation of new blood vessels by activating endothelial cells. And then also interactions between different immune cell pop subpopulations, such as T cells influencing the differentiation of naive macrophages into uh, different cell states. And so in my lab, we're really trying to apply mechanistic and data-driven modeling to understand cell signaling, predict tumor growth, and ultimately explore uh, treatment strategies. So today I'll talk to you uh, and tell you this tale of three scales, uh, all focused on immune cell activation. 
And the first scale is intracellular. So we want to look at signaling that's happening inside of car engineered T cells. And then we build up to a cellular scale by looking at a heterogeneous population of car engineered T cells. And then we sort of switch gears to look at uh, the tissue scale and interactions between cells in the tumor microenvironment. And I'll have a, a stop here between the cellular and tissue scale if there are questions, uh, but happy to also take questions at the end. So when we say CARs, we, I mean chimeric antigen receptors. You've probably heard of them. You're quite excited about this type of immune, uh, immunotherapy. Uh, and CARs are engineered receptors that can be uh, expressed on the surface of immune cells, such as T cells or natural killer cells. And it leads to um, the binding and recognition of a tumor associated antigen that's presented on the surface of tumor cells. And that can lead to activation of the signaling cascades inside of the immune cell and leading to secretion of cytokines and other cytotoxic factors that can target and kill the tumor cell. And this recognition and binding is made possible because the extracellular domain of the CAR is derived from an antibody that's specific to the antigen of interest. That extracellular domain is combined with intracellular signaling domains that are derived from the endogenous T cell receptor. So really trying to mimic what's happening inside of um, the body naturally. And we know that CARs have been very effective, lots of enthusiasm about this, particularly for B cell lymphoma, FDA approved uh, therapies for this type of disease. And it can be even leading to complete remission in patients. But there still can be some serious side effects that happen when T cell activation goes awry. And some of those are motivating factors for just having a more fundamental understanding of the signaling. One is called cytokine storm or cytokine release syndrome. This is an overactivation of the immune system that's thought to occur because the engineered receptors do not have the same control mechanisms that are present in the endogenous T cell receptor. And this can lead to a flooding of the body with uh, cytokines, very harmful or even fatal to patients. Another limitation arises when trying to adapt the therapy to other kinds of cancers. So uh, in the case where it has been very effective, B cell lymphoma, the antigen is called CD19. And that is exclusively expressed on diseased cells. And that same level of specificity is not present in other kinds of cancers. So for example, in solid tumors such as breast cancer, we know that sub, some subtypes have a high expression of HER2, but that receptor can also be expressed in healthy tissues. And so the, the CAR can have on target, so it's targeting the right antigen, but off tumor effects, which can also lead to serious side effects for the patient. So what's being done to address some of these limitations? Well, having um, additional co-stimulatory domains on the CAR to better control the signal is one strategy. Another is to separate out the CAR to be able to target multiple molecules where the combination of that molecule, uh, of those molecules is really only present on tumor cells to address that second limitation or combining these together. So having multiple targets and better control of the signal, for example, through um, chimeric inhibitory receptors such as PD-1 or CTLA-4 or others. But all of these have really been pursued in a guess and check or trial and error approach. And there's no sort of fundamental understanding about the signaling that's at, uh, activated inside of T cells and trying to harness that understanding for better design of cars. And so we feel that this is a nice place where systems biology approaches could be brought to bear to better understand the activation of car engineered T cells and ultimately in the future maybe help design um, more efficient and effective cars. So this work uh, that I'll first talk to you about at the intracellular scale, building a mechanistic model of car T cell activation was pioneered in my lab by Jennifer Roars, my very first PhD student who finished a few years ago. And she helped us to build this mechanistic model and so what we're simulating here is a second generation car. This is one of the FDA approved uh, designs for B cell lymphoma. It targets CD19. It has this CD28 co-stimulatory domain with a few different phosphorylation sites that we need to keep track of, as well as this CD3 zeta domain that's also present in endogenous T cell receptors, which is comprised of three immunotyrosine activating motifs or ITAMs. Uh, each of which has two uh, phosphorylation sites that we need to track. 
An important species here is the kinase that sort of gets everything going. Uh, and this is called LCK, lymphocyte kinase. It undergoes autophosphorylation as well as uh, mediating the phosphorylation of different sites on the car. And once two sites on an ITAM are phosphorylated, then another protein called ZAP70 comes in and binds, and uh, LCK can also mediate phosphorylation of ZAP70. Now, all the while that these activating, these phosphorylation events are occurring, the cell is also recruiting phosphatases. And so this is a negative feedback loop where SHIP1, a phosphatase, can attenuate the signal, mediate the removal of those phosphate groups. Uh, but given strong and durable binding of the antigen to the extracellular domain, the cell can overcome that negative feedback and ultimately signal through this multi-protein complex called the LAT signalosome. So LAD is a scaffolding protein that allows lots of other proteins to um, come together in this multi-protein complex. And then it ultimately signals through the MAPK pathway leading to activation of ERK. And so we know ERK is a transcription factor that promotes cell proliferation in a number of different types of, type of cell. And uh, ERK also provides some positive feedback because it mediates phosphorylation of LCK at a protection site that inhibits this action of the phosphatase ship one. And then we can also think about ways in which the co-stimulatory domain CD28 would enhance or modify or, or, or um, uh, affect the signaling through the MAPK pathway. So we have two adapter proteins, GRB2 and GADS, that can influence uh, CD28's signaling through this uh, particular pathway. Now, this is an overview. It's actually a, a simplified schematic of the mathematical model because it doesn't show all the bimolecular interactions and then leading to the formation of these uh, different uh, signaling complexes. And we can already see that there's positive feedback, there's negative feedback. And so it's not clear how changing the structure of the car, for example, removing an ITAM or mutating one of these phosphorylation sites or taking out altogether the CD28 co-stimulatory domain, how that would change signaling through ERK, uh, the transcription factor. And so that's what we want to accomplish with this mathematical model is to answer questions about what is the signaling, what are the signaling dynamics and how are they influenced by the design of the car, the car structure. So to do this, we use um, mathematical modeling and we're using BioNetGen, which is a rule-based modeling uh, platform that allows us to automatically generate the reaction network. And so the way that this is done is that we define based on biological information, we define uh, biological rules, biochemical rules. For example, GADs can bind to this particular site on CD28. And that interaction happens independently of what's happening on the car. So whether it's fully phosphorylated or not, or whether SAP70 is bound at one or more of the, the ITAMs or not. And so we define these the small subset of rules and then BioNetGen allows us to automatically generate all the different permutations of, of those rules and ultimately gives us a set of ordinary differential equations that describe how the species concentrations evolve over time. And of course, with any model, we have parameter values. So any value uh, that we have in the model that's not already measured experimentally, we need to estimate its, uh, its numerical value. And so to do this, we use a fitting algorithm called particle swarm optimization that allows us to um, match the model outputs to the experimental data. And in the process of doing that, estimate what the optimal parameter value should be. So, what did we first try to accomplish with this mathematical model? Well, we got very, uh, I think we, were, we started out being very ambitious and said, okay, let's use this pretty large model that we get from BioNetGen. Um, my student, Jennifer, collected some experimental data using flow cytometry to see the level of phosphorylation of ZAP70 or um, SLP76 or other species in the signaling network. And we tried to fit those uh, flow cytometry measurements. Uh, and that failed pretty miserably. There's just too much uncertainty um, in the model fits, uh, not enough data to really calibrate the model uh, very well. And so we took another approach then, which is a bottom-up approach. So putting together different sub-modules of this larger network, uh, um, calibrating those sub-modules uh, very closely to experimental data, and then combining them together. 
So I'll talk very briefly about the first submodule that we looked at, which is how LCK uh, becomes catalytically active. And of course, this is important because it mediates downstream signaling. But LCK um, is having its own program by which it becomes catalytically active. That depends on the inhibitory kinase CSK and the phosphatase CD45. And so we found some data in the literature from Ronald Vale's group uh, at UCSF. We fit that data to with our model, and we were able to predict the catalytic activity of LCK in its different forms, monomeric forms as well as dimeric forms. And we used that model to also predict and explain how its catalytic activity is controlled over time. So that was the very first submodel. We published that a few years ago. And then we started marching down the pathways. So now that we could uh, estimate what the catalytic activity of LCK is, then we said, well, what is the rate at which it mediates phosphorylation of different sites on the car? And so here, my student, again, performed experiments and modeling to be, be able to understand LCK-mediated phosphorylation of the car. So the experimental system that she used is um, implemented, uh, we took it from the, the, the work of Ronald Vale, where they put together this liposomal membrane system that's meant to mimic the T cell membrane environment. Uh, we could express different proteins on the membrane, including LCK or different car constructs, add ATP for defined periods of time, and then quantify with phosphoproteomic mass spectrometry the amount of phosphorylation of the different sites on the car. And so I'll show you the uh, experimental data that my student collected. The circles are experimental measurements. The lines are our fit, uh, our model fit to the data. And so what I'm plotting is the amount of phosphorylation, the relative amount of phosphorylation as a function of time. And the time is on the log scale. And this is the amount of phosphorylation of the six different sites on CD3 zeta. And this is a case where the car that we expressed on the liposomal membrane only has CD3 zeta um, domain there. Okay, so we can see uh, the different time courses uh, that she collected for the six different sites. We had a very nice fit to the, mod, uh, to the experimental data and were able to match the model to the data and extract the parameter values. We did a few uh, just checks to confirm that the model does indeed match experimental measurements or at least experimentally calculated values. So we took just the experimental data, again, those are the circles here, and asked the question about what the uh, time would be for uh, the amount of phosphorylation to reach 50%, so the half maximal time. And the circles are what we would calculate just by using the experimental data. The bars are what we would predict with our mathematical model. And again, we have a nice agreement between model and experiments. And then we also looked at uh, cooperativity. So we asked the question if the phosphorylation at the six different sites is interacting at all or if the phosphorylation is happening uh, independently at each of the sites. And the Hill coefficient is a way to um, understand that behavior where if the Hill coefficient is right around one, then it means that the sites are operating independently of one another. Again, we can extract that Hill coefficient based on experimental measurements and those are the circles here or we can predict what would happen with our mathematical model. And those are the bars, again, seeing a very nice match between modeling and experiments. Okay, so this is for a car that has just CD3 zeta. And then we took it a step further to say, well, what happens to the amount of phosphorylation if the car now also has the CD28 co-stimulatory domain? And so these are the experimental measurements that my student collected, the circles here, the lines are again a model fit to those data. And hopefully what you could see is that the circles and their model fit shift to the left, which means that the presence of CD28 co-stimulatory domain on the car enhances or speeds up the rate at which LCK is able to mediate phosphorylation of the CD3 zeta sites. So the presence of CD28 enhances phosphorylation of CD3 zeta. And we could see that clearly with the experimental data and our model fit. We can also see that clearly with the estimated parameter values, where the KCAT value here tells us the catalytic rate of LCK mediating phosphorylation, where in the uh, black hashed bar, it's for um, the case where CD28 is not present, so the car that only has CD3 zeta.
or with the gray bar with the car that has CD28 and CD3 zeta. So we see a threefold increase in the catalytic rate of LCNK. Uh, Jin also um, performed some point mutations to convert the tyrosine sites to phenylalanine in order to see what are the important uh, or what are the effects of these different sites on CD28. But the takeaway message from here is that the presence of CD28 increases the rate at which the sites on CD3 zeta are phosphorylated. And perhaps an explanation of this is really just a physical interaction. So having CD28 there allows uh, LCK to um, come in closer proximity to uh, the CD3 zeta sites and can promote phosphorylation at those sites. So I talked to you about already this first submodel about LCK phosphorylation and activation. Also, the second submodel spent a little bit more time on that to look at how LCK now mediates phosphorylation of different sites on the car. We can combine that with canonical models of negative feedback that happen in uh, endogenous T cell receptor signaling, as well as canonical models for MAPK and ERK phosphorylation along with a new uh, component for the formation of the last signalosome. And here it sort of uh, illustrates even more clearly the modular approach that we took. But now with this full model, we can not only look at phosphorylation of the car or of these individual species, but downstream activation, specifically focusing on ERK phosphorylation. We know that it's a transcription factor, it promotes uh, cell proliferation. And it's shown to be important in endogenous T cell receptor signaling. And so we wanted to look at the dynamics of ERK phosphorylation in the context of CAR signaling. So we asked this question, what is the role of CD28 in that co-stimulatory domain in activating downstream ERK? So how we answer that question is to use our mathematical model to make some new predictions. So we incorporated three different hypotheses as to how CD28 could affect downstream signaling leading to ERK phosphorylation. So the first two are what I mentioned earlier about how uh, it acts, uh, there are different adapter proteins, GRB2 or GADs, that can bind to CD28 and in different ways, either through the LAT signalosome or directly through SOS leading to ERK phosphorylation, uh, could affect ERK. And the third hypothesis uh, that we incorporated is from submodel two that I just described to you that tells us that the presence of CD28 enhances the rate at which LCK mediates phosphorylation of CD3 zeta sites. So we incorporated each of these three hypotheses into our mathematical model individually. I'll, we also did them in pairs. Uh, I won't show that here, but what we then predicted is the ERK response time. This is the amount of time that it takes for um, half of ERK inside of the cells to become doubly phosphorylated. This is a characteristic feature that's also used to understand cell activation in endogenous T cell receptor signaling. So we wanted to look at this uh, for car signaling as well. So what I'm plotting in the blue is the case where the car has just CD3 zeta or in the red dashed line, the case where the car has CD3 zeta along with CD28 either for GRB2 binding only, for GADS binding, or for the enhancement of the CD3 zeta kinetics. And then I'm showing the ERK response time as a function of antigen concentration, so how much uh, stimulation the simulated cells are um, being exposed to. And we see that for GRB2 binding or GADS binding, it has a very similar shape and very similar results where having CD28 there actually slows down the response. And we see that because this red curve is above the blue curve. So it has longer time, uh, it takes longer time to uh, reach the same level of phosphorylation of ERK. And that's in stark comparison to the case where we look at um, the presence of CD28 enhancing CD3 zeta uh, phosphorylation kinetics, where here the red dashed line is below the blue curve for all of the antigen concentrations that we consider. And so it's the models predicting that the presence of CD28 is speeding up the ERK response time, making it uh, shorter. So these are all mo model predictions, novel predictions, and we wanted to test and validate which one would be correct. And so Jin uh, performed more experiments where she um, engineered JERCAT T cells to express either a car that only has CD3 zeta, 
or a car that has CD3 Zeta and CD28. She also engineered K562 cells, so those would be the target cell that then would now express uh, CD19. And then she combined these two cell types in different ratios in order to change the amount of stimulation that the engineered CAR T cells would, ex would receive. And then she measured with flow cytometry the ERK response time. So these are the data that she collected. Again, showing the results for CD3 Zeta only CAR or the CAR that has CD3 Zeta along with CD28. And you can see that for all of the different CAR to target cell ratios, um, there's a clear difference between the two different uh, CARs. And then also uh, the presence of CD28 looks to speed up the ERK response time. So just to remind you, this is what our model predicted. So there's a really nice uh, qualitative validation of the model predictions. Now you might be scratching your head and raising your eyebrow about why there's a difference in the magnitude of the ERK response time. So maybe even an order of magnitude or several fold higher. And uh, I, we think that it's because the model doesn't capture those physical interactions that we see with the, the two uh, cell types. And so we, we're not capturing that. And maybe that's why we have uh, are predicting a slightly longer ERK response time. But certainly, right, the experimental results look closer to this uh, model prediction compared to what we would predict for just GRB2 binding or GADS binding. So the takeaway message here is that we have this mechanistic model that can explain the effect of CD28, how it influences T cell activation with a focus on uh, the level of phosphorylation of ERK. So then we said, well, that's nice, right? We can understand what's happening inside um, an average cell or a single cell, but can we look at what's happening on the population level? And why is this important? Uh, it's important because when we think about uh, this type of immunotherapy, it's called adoptive T cell therapy, where the patient's own T cells are harvested. They're engineered outside of the patient's body to now express the CAR. And then this population of CAR engineered T cells is provided back to the patient. And so there's necessarily going to be some heterogeneity in that cell population. And we wanted to ask the question of how does that influence overall the response at the population level? And so a current student in the lab, Colin Sess, started to work on this to simulate a heterogeneous population of CAR engineered T cells. And where is the heterogeneity coming from? Well, he varied the initial concentrations of the signaling species. That's one form of cell to cell heterogeneity, the initial starting amounts of these species, and then simulated the model. So we ran a simulation for 100,000 cells, each cell having a different uh, starting concentration where we just drew from a gamma distribution for the initial concentrations over a defined range, again, taking the range and the distribution from experimental literature, and then simulated this population of cells. So I'll just show you a representative sample of 100 cells, not all 100,000. And what I'm showing is the amount of phosphorylation of ERK as a function of time. And so you can see, even with this sample of 100 cells, that there is a lot of variability. So there are some cells that have this curve that reaches 100% phosphorylation of ERK very rapidly within just a couple of minutes. Other cells do also reach 100% phosphorylation, but it takes a several fold longer. And then some cells never reach 100% phosphorylation. And so what we wanted to do is just to understand what is influencing this variability and first um, classify the final response of ERK as either being low or high. Low meaning it has less than 50% phosphorylation, high meaning the amount of phosphorylation of ERK at 15 minutes is greater than 50%. And just a little bit of motivation about why we have this uh, binary classification. Um, it's just, we can look here at the distribution of the ERK response for our 100,000 cells. You can clearly see this bimodality um, where 90% of the cells either have a very high level of phosphorylation of ERK or a low phosphorylation of ERK. And this is also seen in endogenous T cell receptor signaling as well, where an analog signal of changing the amount of uh, the stimulation that the cells receives receive leads to 
um, a digital response either on or off for ERK. So it's already known to occur in endogenous T cell receptor signaling. We see it also here in CAR signaling. So the question becomes, how can we separate the low and high uh, responding ERK cells just based on the initial concentrations, right? That's the only uh, level of heterogeneity that we incorporated into the model. We changed the initial concentrations across this population of 100,000 cells. Can we now relate our inputs, the initial concentrations, to the outputs? And the way that we did this is using partial least squares regression or I like to just call this machine learning light, but it's just regression analysis uh, to relate the inputs to the outputs. And so one part of PLSR is to initially do um, a principal component analysis where we're just trying to make sure that we can indeed separate out these two populations. Now there is some overlap here right in the center, but we can clearly see uh, two clouds, one with the low ERK responding cells and one with the high ERK responding cells, mainly in this uh, first dimension, this first component, uh, which captures about 90% of the variability in our uh, simulated data. So then we said we can separate out the populations for high and low. Can we now predict which of the inputs, which of the initial concentrations most strongly influence that classification? And so part of PLSR is to get out what's called the variable importance of projection score or VIP score. And it asks, allows us to answer this question about which initial concentrations influence the ERK response. And so I've just highlighted um, the initial concentrations that have a VIP score greater than one, which is a good rule of thumb to use to say that that input uh, significantly influences the output. And so we can see here CD3 zeta is important. Uh, LCK is important, and then also some species in the MAPK pathway. But this just tells us which species are important. We can go further and see uh, how are they important. One note here is that the initial amount of ERK is not a predictor about whether the response will be high or low. So it doesn't really matter how much ERK the cells start out with. It doesn't um, influence the final high or low classification of the ERK response. So with um, moving forward and looking at the weight, so this tells us how influential the species are and in what direction the initial concentrations would pull the uh, final response. We can answer this question about how do the initial concentrations influence the ERP response. So I've darkened the bars that have a VIP score greater than one, and then I've color coded them all to say if the color is blue, that means that increasing the concentration of that species shifts the cells towards having a higher ERK response. If it's red, then increasing the concentration of that species shifts the cell towards having a lower ERK response. So some of these make really perfect sense, right? Increasing the amount of LCK, that kinase, uh, would lead the cells towards having a higher ERK response. Another thing that makes sense, increasing the amount of the phosphatases shifts the cells towards having a low ERK response, so phosphatase chip one. But what we were um, not uh, clear about is the prediction for CD3 zeta, where it has a red bar, which means that increasing the expression of CD3 zeta in the car would actually lead the cells towards having a lower ERK response. And so we wanted to understand this prediction and try to explain why it's coming out of our analysis. And so to do that, we turned back to our mechanistic model, the ODE model, um, and said, well, what happens if we vary the amount of CD3 zeta and go from a very low amount of 50 micromolar all the way up to 5,000 micromolar? So we can clearly see that it shifts the cells towards having a slower ERK response, but at the same time, it increases the amount of the phosphatase. So this is the way in which um, changing the ERK or sorry, changing the CD3 zeta expression actually recruits more of the phosphatases to attenuate the signal. And that's how increasing uh, CD3 zeta expression actually leads to a lower ERK response. So the model helps us to explain this maybe um, counterintuitive or non-intuitive prediction that having too much activation of cell signaling, meaning too much expression of the car, can actually have unintended effects by actually uh, reducing the final level of ERK phosphorylation. 
So just to summarize these two scales that I presented so far, intracellular and cellular, uh, we have constructed a mechanistic model of CAR T cell activation. The model helps us to explain how different CAR constructs, namely the CAR that has CD3 zeta alone or CD3 zeta in combination with the co-stimulatory domain called CD28, how those two different CARs would influence T cell signaling and cell activation. And then we combined the mechanistic model, the ODE model, with the data-driven approach to identify the influential model inputs. And by doing that combination of mechanistic and data-driven modeling, we can gain better insight into how to modulate the cell response. So just as an example, maybe there is a certain um, level of ERK phosphorylation or really um, a time scale over which we would like to see the uh, ERK become fully phosphorylated. We can use this combination of modeling approaches to say, well, which uh, protein should we overexpress or which protein expression should we reduce in order to achieve that desired response. So we learned a lot from intracellular and cellular scales. We next wanted to move up to the tissue scale. And here we're interested in modeling the tumor immune ecosystem. So now not just what's happening inside of immune cells, but how does the immune cell activation influence the growth of the tumor. And so you can see that we're actually building up across scales because we can look at intracellular signaling, embed that into a cell, and then look at how cells interact with one another and lead to uh, the growth of the tumor, um, tumor mass. So here we're moving away from ODE modeling and instead focusing on what's called agent-based modeling, which allows us to study these interactions between cells and also predict the response to treatment. So, and this is a uh, work that Colin has continued to, to move forward in the lab. So um, the kind of model that we're looking at is agent-based model. This means that we are focusing on individual agents. The agents or the entities are six different cell types. So we have tumor cells, we have inactive and active T cells, and then we have three forms of macrophages. And I'll come back to this in, in a couple of slides. We also have, uh, on top of just looking at individual cells, we can also predict the concentrations of diffusible factors, proteins, or in this case, cytokines, um, called IL-4 and interferon gamma. And their concentrations and distribution in this 2D space is described by partial differential equations. So just to give a little bit more insight into the model structure, we have these different uh, entities. So T cells can mediate tumor cell killing once the T cell and the tumor cell come into contact with one another and the T cell becomes activated, then it can promote tumor cell killing. Um, macrophages, one form of macrophages that are called M1 macrophages, enhance T cell mediated tumor cell killing. So M1 macrophages are um, anti-tumor and on the other hand, M2 macrophages are pro-tumor, so they inhibit um, tumor cell killing. And T cells secrete a cytokine called interferon gamma that promotes the differentiation of macrophages from a naive state into the M1 state. And tumor cells and macrophages, M2 macrophages, secrete another protein called IL-4 that promotes differentiation of naive macrophages into the M2 state. So this shows the um, kinds of cell-cell interactions that we have, right? Direct uh, like interactions between the cells or interactions that are mediated by the uh, different cytokines that we have in the model. And just to also give you a little bit of insight into that other um, aspect of the partial differential equations. So we want to know how much of the cytokines are present and where are they present. And so we can saw we can understand that by solving the partial differential equations. Uh, and so I'm just illustrating that here with the yellow color where IL-4 is secreted by tumor cells and macrophages. And so it might have a higher concentration here in the center and then it can diffuse away and you can see lighter colors of yellow indicating lower concentrations here in the periphery. So one other aspect of the model itself that I wanted to talk about is how we're incorporating intracellular signaling, again, building up across scales. And so there's a nice model that was published uh, in 2019 
that looked at signaling pathways that influence or mediate uh, macrophage differentiation. And it tells us how a naive macrophage becomes activated and goes towards an M2 or an M1 phenotype. And so we wanted to incorporate that kind of level of detail into the model so that the behavior of macrophages and whether they become M2 or M1 is directly informed by this intracellular signaling. And so just to show you, this is a, a toy model, but what we could do is take a model like what Zhao published. It's an ODE based model. We could simulate the model um, hundreds of thousands of times, basically doing Monte Carlo simulations with different concentrations of the inputs to the model and get a range of different model predictions. That gives us this simulated data set and we take as the output from that data set whether the cell, the macrophage, would go towards an M2 or an M1 phenotype. And that decision is made based on the area under the curve of the signaling species that promote M2 relative to the sum of the area of the, under the curve for the signaling species that promote uh, differentiation towards M1. So really it's this M2, M1 score. If it's greater than one, then the cell will go towards M2, otherwise it's M1. Um, and so we get this categorical output to our simulated data, again, having run it hundreds of thousands of times with different uh, input values. And then we encode the simulated data using a neural network so that we can say, given an input, what would the response be? Whether the cell would go towards M1 or M2. And then we embed that neural network inside of each of our macrophage agents so that given the amount of um, IL-4 that the cell experiences in its local microenvironment or interfering gamma, it would be processed through this neural network and then go towards an M2 or an M1 phenotype. Okay, so this is how we can incorporate an intracellular program that drives the cell behavior. And running the ODE model outside of the agent-based model uh, and then encoding it with a neural network allows us to greatly speed up our computations instead of having a, the full ODE model inside of each macrophage. So I've talked a lot about the model. What did we apply it to uh, do? What kinds of questions can we answer? We can look at the cell's dynamics over time. We can also look at the effects of different immunotherapies. So starting with the cell's dynamics, actually just a snapshot in time, we can see the distribution of cells in our 2D um, microenvironment, where we have a, a massive tumor cells here, lots of inactive T cells, um, a few um, active T cells around the periphery of the tumor, those are shown in red, and then uh, a lot of M2 macrophages as well. But we can also look at the time courses. And so because agent-based models are probabilistic, this means that every time we run the model, we could get slightly different results because there's a probability that a cell would undergo a certain behavior at any time point. And so we ran the model 100 times in order to try to extract what the uh, general uh, conclusions are. So out of those 100 times, 99 of them showed that the number of cancer cells, this is without any treatment, would be um, controlled just by the endogenous uh, immune population. And just one out of 100, and that, that's the one I'm showing in red, is the case where the tumor population is eliminated just due to the endogenous immune cell population. And this uh, equilibrium state of the tumor cell dynamics um, can be thought to represent the immune control phase of tumor growth that occurs over months or years, involves the selection of of tumor cells that are responsive to the immune environment, but could ultimately um, become resistant to the immune system and then lead to uh, exponential growth again. But we certainly see that in that control phase uh, for M2 cells and then also for tumor cells, uh, both the total number of tumor cells and the number of active tumor cells as well, or sorry, total number of T cells and active number of T cells as well. So this is just the time course. Then we wanted to say, well, what happens when we simulate different therapies, immunotherapies? And these are all macrophage-based therapies that we decided to um, study with this mathematical model. We can try three different strategies, um, taking inspiration from the literature and even uh, phase one clinical trials. 
where it's been um, tried, uh, it's been pursued to deplete macrophages, so get rid of all macrophages, to inhibit their recruitment towards the tumor, or to re-educate macrophages, converting that pro-tumor macrophage M2 into an anti-tumor macrophage M1. And so we tried all three of these strategies individually in order to see their efficacy in removing the tumor. So one major output or uh, prediction that we get from the model is the fraction of tumors that is removed. And again, we're running the model um, 100 times uh, for each of these different settings. And then we can say out of those 100, how many cases uh, was there with the, the tumor completely removed. So what I'm plotting is the fraction of tumors removed. This is just for the case of depleting macrophages. On the x-axis is the probability that any macrophage would have of being removed from the, from the simulation. And we can see that as we increase the depletion probability, even just a small change can lead to a drastic increase in the efficacy of this treatment and further increases meaning, mean that all the tumors would be removed. We can also see how long does it take for the tumor to be removed across different depletion probabilities. And as we increase the depletion probabilities up to a certain point, then the time that it takes decreases. We can do the same simulations for inhibiting recruitment of macrophages or re-educating macrophages. Again, we see that increasing the strength of the treatment would lead to an increase in the efficacy. We see a very sharp increase in the case of re-educating macrophages. And then in general, it takes a shorter period of time to remove the tumor when we consider re-educating macrophages compared to inhibiting their recruitment or depleting macrophages altogether. Now, along with just looking at whether the tumor is removed or not, we can also look at the composition of the tumor. And in particular, we focused on the um, pro-immune uh, pro cells, so the M1 cells and the active T cells. And we can see how the numbers of these cell populations change depending on the treatment strategy. So the takeaway message from here is that with re-educating macrophages, we get a lot more M1 uh, macrophages, which is what we would expect, right? That's the purpose of the treatment to convert M2 to M1 and to promote the differentiation of naive macrophages in, in, into M1 state. Um, and so that definitely happens. But a side effect, uh, a collateral effect, is that we also have a larger number of active T cells. So this treatment strategy is effective because it not only increases the number of um, anti-tumor macrophages, but it also enhances activation of T cells as well. And then maybe just one last set of results is to look at what happens when we cycle treatment on and off. So this previous slide um, I showed is the case where we have continuous treatment uh, for either depleting macrophages, inhibiting their recruitment, or um, uh, converting M2 to M1. And then we said, well, what happens if we cycle on and off treatment, which is relevant in the case of thinking about patient compliance or just wanting to give the smallest amount of uh, treatment um, to avoid side effects. And so we can turn on and off treatment for a period of time and do that either for depleting macrophages, for inhibiting their recruitment or converting um, M2 to M1. And in the case of inhibiting recruitment, we see, and again, the, the, actually the colored uh, boxes here, the darker the color, that means that the larger the fraction of tumors that is removed. And so we wanna see more darker boxes. And in the case for inhibiting recruitment, we see a lot of white boxes, which means that the treatment is not effective when we cycle it on and off. And that's in comparison to depleting macrophages or re-educating macrophages. And even in this case of re-educating macrophages, we find that um, even for a long cycle, so up to 25 days, and when the treatment is only on for two days out of that cycle, then the uh, re-education of macrophages is still predicted to be very effective in eliminating tumors. And I won't show you, but we also look at, again, the number of M1 macrophages, the number of active T cells, and this is, again, shown to be very effective strategy for improving the immune composition of the tumor. 
So it's shown to be very effective uh, to re-educate macrophages both in uh, removing tumors and doing that in a shorter period of time and improving the immune composition of the tumor. So with that, I will summarize this part of the talk on the tissue scale. We put together a multi-scale model of tumor immune interactions. We also included intracellular signaling by encoding the signaling network using a neural network. We use the model to predict the dynamics of cells and also the diffusible factors, the cytokines. I didn't show it here, but we can look at their dynamics over time as well. And then we applied the model to investigate the efficacy of different immunotherapeutic strategies, finding that re-educating macrophages is shown to be very effective in removing tumors and improving the tumor uh, immune uh, um, composition as well. So with that, I will thank the members of my lab, um, especially Jennifer Roars, whose work I presented in the first part of the talk, and Colin Sess, who is continuing in studying the tumor immune ecosystem, um, as well as our collaborators. This is us uh, outside of my house in May when we were celebrating um, the graduation of a few students uh, over the spring. Also uh, acknowledge our funding sources and thank all of you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Finley, for this wonderful talk. So we have a larger audience today. So if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. If you are in person at our forum hall, please just walk up to the podium and ask a question there. Hi, I have a question. Uh, this is Maureen. Um, so I, I, first of all, it was a really awesome talk. Thank you. I was really interested in the, the last part of it because it's uh, relevant to some of my research in, in cancer. And I was wondering um, what I'm basically for immunotherapy. I'm uh, um, familiar with the anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL1. What is the treatment that's used to re-educate the M2 to M1 cell? Yeah. It's, uh, in this case, we were simulating, okay, yeah, in this case, we were simulating PI3 kinase inhibition. So that's been shown as one strategy to um, enhance differentiation towards M1 and to convert M2 to M1. There are other strategies um, that have also been looked at preclinically. But this is one of those that um, can be used to do to perform the re-education. So how important, I remember that in that one slide you showed the IL-4 and the interferon gamma. Um, is the ratio of those two genes really important in it? Yeah, so we tried in, in putting together the simulated um, data set to then produce the neural network we varied IL-4 and interferon gamma. So those were the inputs that we varied. And we didn't, I actually, we didn't go back and look at that simulated data set very closely um, to see whether it's the absolute concentrations or their relative amounts. Instead, we mainly focused on the downstream signaling elements. But that's a really great question to, to dig more into um, because maybe it doesn't matter so much the absolute values. That's probably what I would predict but rather, rather their uh, relative concentrations. Yeah, I was kind of wondering, like, could you use, like, I do a lot of RNA-seq uh, for gene expression data. I was wondering if there's some way to use, you know, some function of various genes to predict mm -hmm. um, the ratio of the M1, M2, and to predict which patients might be good candidates for the treatment. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I think it would be nice to go back, even with, you know, running this many different times, maybe with different um, rates of interactions between the cells or different uh, propensity for uh, differentiation or uh, tumor cell killing. So incorporating more heterogeneity here and then seeing can we predict what are relationships between the final response and some of the characteristics of the cell uh, that we could explore. So that's definitely one um, direction that we're taking this work is to now have this platform. And it's right now it's just, you know, agnostic to the tumor type. 
but importantly, we need to um, make it specific, for example, to a particular cancer type and then use it to say, uh, can we gain any insights into which um, tumor microenvironmental conditions or patient specific properties would influence the response to treatment. Great, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, may I ask another question? So, uh, so I wonder uh, whether this model is uh, public available. Like, if I want to try the model to simulate anything, uh, can I maybe download from your GitHub or how to use that? Yes, um, this model is available. Both the second two, well, okay, so that means that all of them. So definitely, the tissue scale is available on GitHub. And then for Colin's paper, we also put the model on GitHub, which essentially is right this full model that I talked about in the first part for CAR um, mediated T cell activation. So we've been trying to be more diligent about putting everything on GitHub for this exact purpose to provide it to the community and then also for rigor and reproducibility as well. Um, so this, this model, um, the paper was published in 2020 and the model is available on GitHub and it is uh, in C++. The other model is in MATLAB. I see. Um, so if you can send us the link to these repositories, we are able to update your talk information so that other people, while we, we attract a lot of audience online, so they may be able to visit your website uh, sure. and find models. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say also we've expanded even since then. So, you know, especially as, you know, a model developer, you're always thinking about other ways to improve the model. And so now it's a center-based model and it's in 3D um, to better, to be more realistic. Uh, center-based meaning there can be overlap between cells instead of having just them on a lattice. And we've also incorporated um, the presence of vessels, blood vessels that provide nutrients and oxygen. And so that means that we're also accounting in, you know, very simple terms, uh, metabolism as well. So there, there are new features and we have a, another version of the model on GitHub that has that that shows those features too. Well, I also wonder if, because right now there are a lot of like codex image of, available for cancer tissue. Will this type of um, single cell, like uh, spatially resolved uh, imaging data be kind of give you some additional information to train or I, I just feel that can yeah. might be useful. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We are super excited about um, some of the immuno like spatial immuno profiling because that can give like the XY or the XYZ coordinates uh, for a particular patient's tumor or even for a mouse tumor slide. And that could be the input, the starting point for our simulations where we, it would really nicely complement the experiments because we can provide the trajectories um, and then also look at different um, immunotherapeutic or other uh, therapeutic strategies. So that's exactly what we're doing now. We're collaborating with one researcher at USC uh, who has some mouse samples for breast cancer to do this. Um, and we're taking some data, uh, published codex data and other um, immunofluorescence data for pancreatic cancer and colorectal cancer uh, that's already been published in the literature. So you're absolutely right. That's where we're going next uh, to try to use the data as a starting point and uh, predict the predictions, uh, make the predictions on a patient specific uh, level. That's really cool. Uh, I think we are right on time. It's five o'clock okay. uh, our time. So we are really excited. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. And we hope to see you again sometime in person, hopefully. Yes, that would Thank be great. You. Thanks for hosting me. I appreciate it. Have a nice evening. Bye. Yeah.